everybody. I'm talking again to Professor William Webb. You may remember that a couple of weeks ago, William and I had a chat about 5G, myth or reality, and the conclusion possibly was that it's uh, leaning a little more towards myth than reality. Well, in the wireless world, when things started to go quiet because markets like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi were maturing, the next thing, big thing was said to be the Internet of Things, IoT. Um, companies were falling over themselves to be part of this to make sure that they didn't miss out. But today, William, I can't really see that IoT has happened in the way that it was thought to be about to happen. Um, why do you think this is and what really has happened to the IoT industry? Yes, you're absolutely right, Vince, that IoT has not happened in the way it was forecast. The, the initial forecast that really kicked everything off dates back actually to 2010. And it was both Cisco and Ericsson put out their 50 billion devices by 2020 forecast. So they were assuming in the next 10 years that there would be 50 billion connected devices. Now, Cisco actually published their virtual network index, which keeps tabs of how many devices they think are out there. And the moment they're saying there's about six to eight billion connected devices. So we're almost at the end of that initial forecast period and we're at about 15%, maybe 20% of the amount forecast. So a long way off what we expected. And interestingly, if you dig into where those six to eight billion devices are, about half of them are in the home. And that's the form of connected thermostats, the, the nest and the hive kind of thing, the smart speakers, a lot of those kind of things that we hook up via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi around our home. Most of the other half are in the office doing very similar kind of things, just simple connectivity in the office. The number of devices that are connected outside of those buildings in the bigger world, the smart cities and the asset tracking and all those other kind of things that we thought would be the big drivers is very small at the moment. And that's really where it's been most disappointing to date. So where, where did it go wrong? I mean, who should have been underpinning mm. this type of growth in order for us to have a, something other than a Internet of things inside buildings? Yeah, so there's a number of different answers to that. I think the, the easiest one to fix on is to look at the networks. If you're going to connect devices outside of the building, you, you need some sort of network to connect them to. Yeah. Now, in some cases, if it's, say, a smart airport, you can build your own network. You only need perhaps two or three base stations to cover the whole airport. That's quite viable. But if you want to do asset tracking, let's say, across the whole country, then you need obviously a nationwide network and really you need a mobile operator or some kind of operator to do that. And until very recently, the mobile operators just offered their standard mobile technology, 2G, 3G, 4G, for that kind of connectivity. And for most devices, that wasn't suitable because of the battery drain. There were a few where it worked fine. Connected cars, they've got a, a big power source, that's no problem. But for most of the sensor kind of activities, it just wasn't suitable. Some of the mobile operators are now deploying a specific narrowband IoT or NB-IoT technology, which is much better for that. So it's possible that that technology might resolve some of these problems. Equally, I'm not sure they've yet managed to get their heads around quite how to introduce this and how to make money out of it. So it wouldn't surprise me if even with the technology, they lack the focus to deliver that. So that's one kind of culprit, if you like, that you could point a finger at. I think as well, it's been difficult to get together sufficient demand to really stimulate all the different people that need to invest, the chipset manufacturers, the, the application providers and so on. And it's hard to point a finger particularly at anyone, but I think if I had to, I might pick government strangely, because it seems to me that actually something like perhaps 50% of all of the connected devices might well have some kind of governmental role at heart. So smart cities are typically governmental or local authority kind of things. Healthcare falls under a lot of government activity. All the military stuff is obviously governmental. Quite a lot of transportation is governmental. So actually, if government were to aggregate their demand and place some big orders and some big contracts, that might stimulate things potentially. But we know how poor governments are at that kind of intelligent supplier, intelligent buyer kind of role. Do you think there's possibly any standards-based element to this? If there'd been a single standard for people to work to, like the was GSM in the mm. cellular industry or internet protocol, would, would that have made a difference? It certainly would have helped. So 
we know from many other kind of examples, BHS versus Betamax is a classic one quoted, but many others like that, that where there is more than one standard, then often you get people holding back from making an investment because they're not sure which is the right one. Mm. And because they hold back, the whole system doesn't get going until we collapse down to one standard. We've certainly got too many standards on the connectivity side. We've got a number of different cellular ones, 2G, 3G, 4G, narrowband IoT, LTEM. There's also a number on the unlicensed side for wide area, Sigfox, LoRa, waitlist, which I represent. And there's even a number for in-building, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, although that's less of a problem because you can they, they both tend to exist, so you can just pick one or the other to make that one work. So yes, I think collapsing that down would help. And there's probably other standards at high levels, particularly around things like security that would be helpful. We've seen a lot of security concerns in the last year or two as we've seen hacks of various things like home security cameras, home dolls and smart kettles, although I've never quite worked out why you'd want a smart kettle anyway. Uh, and that in itself is causing many people to stop and say, do I really want another connected device in my life? There might be a slight upside, but the downside might be quite high. So, so good standards around security, and in particular ones that are strongly enforced so that we can be sure that stuff we buy really does adhere to them, I think would be important. So uh, let's finish with the big question. Mm. In your opinion, what is the future for IoT? And is this promise that we were once all dreaming about of millions of connected devices per square kilometer, is that plausible at all or is it a pipe dream? <laughs> I think that's a pipe dream. So if we look at what's been talked about in 5G, they do say 5G is needed because there's going to be, as you rightly say, millions of connected devices per kilometer squared. Well, we haven't even got hundreds of connected devices per kilometer squared. So that's a, a massive, massive increase. And as we've talked about, you know, we're struggling to even get towards the, the 50 billion, let alone the, 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 the many trillions that we needed for that. So that seems to me completely false. And also, we don't need any new technology. We're only just rolling out the 4G IoT technology now. And we need to wait and see whether that delivers on what we want. So absolutely, all those kind of visions of sudden, dramatic, large numbers of connected things, I think experience tells us are completely wrong. Instead, I think it's going to be a slow, steady grind. And it seems to me that actually we'll see a mix of stuff. We'll see a bit more connected home, although I don't expect to be living in a home where every light, every window, every lock is all connected. I do have a connected thermostat. That seems to be a, a moderately useful kind of thing. Um, beyond that, I'm not sure there's that much more connectivity that I particularly want in my home. And I think most people also start to worry now about what happens when it stops working? Mm -hmm. What happens if I'm using a connected door lock and I come home one evening and for whatever reason, my password no longer works and I can't get into my home. So that will limit there. But there is a lot of productivity improvement arguments that you can make. We talked a bit about the agriculture one, the smart factory and so on. All of those seem to me to be sensible places where you can say, you know what, if we implement IoT, on our farm, on our airport, in our factory, on our oil refinery, we can save one or two percent of operational costs. And actually the cost of the IoT system is so small that in just a year or two years, it'll pay back for itself. And it's worth doing because we're always striving to reduce our costs. That seems to me to be the way ahead. Slow, steady application for productivity improvements into business applications that will gradually grow these kind of systems. So it, yes, it does seem to me more likely to be those companies that have that intelligent layer that allows the end users to pick up a complete package and to run with it, uh, and maybe to have the ongoing management and so on that keeps it working well. William, fascinating as ever. Thank you so much. I look forward to our next chat. Indeed. Thank you, Vince, you're very welcome.